Uh, good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Welcome to the first Grand Rounds of this academic year. Uh, before I continue, our thoughts and prayers to those of you who have family or anyone who you know who is recovering from Harvey and Houston and surrounding areas, or a family who's being pounded by Irma, like my family, uh, over the past few hours, and that will continue to be worried over the next uh, few days about what's happening. Um, we'll, see, we'll see what happens in those regions. Hopefully those people are kept safe uh, and we can help in any way we can. As is usual for Grand Rounds, as has become tradition, the Chair of Medicine delivers the first Grand Rounds of the year, which I'm pleased to do so. But also it's become tradition uh, for us to celebrate and remember people or events that have changed uh, the way we think about medicine, about history, about the way uh, we consider biology and the world around us. And so today we celebrate and remember these three individuals who were born on this day. Okay? And the first is Dr. Ferdinand von Hebra, who was born on this day back in 1816. I don't know if Jeff Kalin is here, but he was an Austrian physician who founded the new Vienna School of Dermatology, which was one of the uh, premier institutions of that time and was a, a basis for modern dermatology. Uh, among the many diseases of the skin, he described and named lupus, pityriasis, rubra and tinea curis, and he was the first to describe dermatitis herpetiformis, which is kind of interesting. We also celebrate Michael DeBakey. Many of you remember that name or have ever met Michael DeBakey. He died some years ago, I believe. He's an American physician, was a bailer for most of his career, a pioneer in cardiovascular surgery. He developed a graft that revolutionary surgery in aneurysm repair. DeBakey performed in 1953 the first successful carotid endarterectomy treatment for stroke. He was the first successful, uh, who performed a successful artificial heart implant in 1963 and directed the first uh, world's multiple organ transplant from one donor, uh, donor, and that was in 1968. And we also celebrate Sir John Cornforth, John Cornforth, who was born on this day in 1917. John Warcup Cornforth is an Australian-British chemist who shared the Nobel Prize in 1975 for chemistry with Vladimir Prelog for all his work that he did in the stereochemistry of catalytic reactions, enzyme catalytic reactions in the, in the body. He was looking at how hydrogens were disconnected from one protein to another and all that sophisticated work that sort of is very important today, particularly in industry and developing of new uh, therapeutic agents. We also take this opportunity to celebrate people in our midst who are actually doing great things that uh, I think over time will be recognized as important for the way of understanding uh, how we take care of patients. And, and this day goes to cardiology. I just, uh, this week I received the notice of award uh, for Dr. Boley and his tremendous team for uh, a renovation of his program project grant for the United. So congratulations, Dr. Boley. I knew he was coming this morning here. Where is he? Uh, there he is. Okay. And also from his division, Dr. Sanjay Sivastavan, who obtained his uh, Superfund grant. I just saw the notice of award. We, we celebrate them when we hear about it, and then we celebrate again when the notice of award comes, because we never know if that notice of award uh, comes here, considering the situation at the NIH. So congratulations to that. You might recall, as I mentioned to you this uh, past faculty meeting, that I think this institution will uh, benefit from 20 to $25 million over the next five years from grants generated from investigators in this department and their collaborators all around um, uh, the institution. And I celebrated during the faculty meeting, this gentleman here, Marius Bradashak, who's bringing the first T32 grant uh, to this department as well. So uh, tremendous congratulations to our investigators. And we're going to talk about investigators uh, today a little bit. Now, over the years, I have spent this time in talking about historical figures and about uh, giving you a little bit of uh, information about the department. It's sort of become the state of the union of the department. And we have done less and less of that because we spent a lot of time about discussing the department, its finances, and its challenges and opportunities uh, when we talk to division chiefs, when we talk to uh, the faculty during quarterly meetings and in my newsletters. So today I'm not going to discuss much about this department. Don't leave yet. Uh, but 
several people over the past six months have been approaching me, particularly students and residents and a couple of junior faculty who asked me, what is it that you do other than lead the department? Do you do other stuff other than see patients? And what do you do in the lab? And it would be nice, and Henry's laughing because he mentioned this to me as well, about what, it would be nice for, for us to hear about what you do. And I, I thought I would give you, um, this grand rounds uh, would determine to focus on a little bit of what we do, but specifically on what we do that allows me to see my patients in a different way, way of science. And we'll talk about that, OK? So some of you know that I've been going to Puerto Rico on a monthly basis for the past eight months trying to uh, identify patients with pulmonary fibrosis. There are no uh, experts or centers devoted to pulmonary fibrosis in Puerto Rico. Uh, there's no lung transplant programs and so forth. So I go every month. And I saw this patient last week. 67 years old, Hispanic female. I want to remind everybody for Grand Rounds, always start with a clinical case so that we make this clinically relevant. So this is a 67 year old Hispanic female, progressive dyspnea on exertion. She has some cough. She has no relevant environmental exposures except the most damaging of all, which is smoking. She smokes about a pack a day for over 35 years. She has limited uh, in her exertion. She can't go up a flight of stairs without stopping and catching her breath. Now, her physical exam was not very impressive, except for very impressive crackles on the basis, clubbing, uh, and she was thin. And, but she didn't look short of breath while sitting down. And other than that, not much else in the physical exam that is relevant for us today. Because this was done last week, and the CT, I couldn't get it off the computer, uh, so I looked for a CT scans and the internet that would be similar to her CT because she had two find actually she had three findings that were crucial and they are highlighted in the CT which is not that different from her CT and here's the CT scan a traditional high resolution CT scan from top to bottom of the lung and you see top and back here and what you see is that as you go further down that lung starts looking a little bit different or worse and the first thing you see is these holes here where there's no lung parenchyma that is emphysema Mm -hmm. You're not surprised, and she smoked a lot, but people are surprised when I tell them that only 20 to 25 percent of chronic smokers actually develop chronic lung disease. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to understand what happens to the majority of us if we smoke, that we don't develop this. What are the protective factors that do that? But also, as you go farther down, you start seeing these areas here, which are not characteristic of emphysema. If anything, they're characteristic of fibrosis. And in fact, I believe, although this patient, I've only seen her once, and we're starting to do some tests on her, that she has chronic emphysema from tobacco, but she also has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is more common as you age. And we've talked about that extensively uh, last year. So she has a double whammy, double hit. And there's some data to suggest, although not well described yet, that these patients may have a much worse prognosis. If you look at their pulmonary function test, they're closer to normal because emphysema expands your lung, fibrosis shrinks it, but your diffusion capacity, your ability to transfer oxygen decreases dramatically, and her DLCO is likely going to be quite reduced. So I'm already, as a physician, I'm already to think, well, while I'm talking to her, I'm already to think about what are the things I need to do. Well, I want, I'm going to want to look at her lung impairment. So I do pulmonary function tests so I can quantify it and follow it over time. I want to look at lung structure, which I've done through the HRCT. I want to look at her oxygen requirements. In fact, we walk them. Uh, I'm, I'm usually the one in a suit in a, in a Puerto Rico uh, hospital walking people around the hallways, checking their oxygen. I want to address the issue of smoking with smoking cessation. Uh, I want to address the issue of cough with antitussive agents. She didn't have primary care, so we refer her to a primary care, address vaccinations. We educated her a little bit about her disease. This is the first visit, and we didn't have a lot of time, but we spent some time with her and her husband discussing about what we think is going to happen. And we started thinking about futures. Is she going to need pulmonary rehab? You bet she will. Am I going to need an interventionalist or somebody else to determine what that lesion is in the lung that, that may be suspicious for cancer? Will I need an oncologist? Who do I call for an oncologist who understands what's going on? She's unlikely to be resectable or cured because of her chronic lung disease. If she doesn't have cancer, is she eligible for lung transplant? Are there other issues that are going to affect this? So if I do all of that, I'm doing the doctor thing. You all know what the doctor thing is. I can develop a differential diagnosis. I can order appropriate tests. I can reach a correct diagnosis, hopefully. I can prescribe appropriately. I can make appropriate referrals. And I must 
demonstrate compassion and empathy for this patient so that they understand that I kind of get a sense of what they're going through. And then I engage in e-prescription, and I document extensively in the electronic record, and I build correctly. These are all the things that have been added to the tool set of the physician. And with all this stuff, this is almost irrelevant for some insurers and so forth. And then we decide on how to follow diligently. Now, as you have seen from previous grand rounds in the past, I get anxious about this because I do this over and over and over again, and I'm not changing much outcome. But let's think about this a little bit. In the end, what I have is an elderly, frail, dysnaic Hispanic female who is a smoker and has a progressive, irreversible fibrosing interstitial lung disease and irreversible emphysema with a likelihood of total disability soon and a 50% chance of dying over the next two years. And I don't have much to address this. I can do a lot. I can do a lot of tests. And I can prescribe a lot of inhalers. But I won't be able to reverse much of what's going on here. And so I'm doing what most clinician educators do. I mean, we, we see a lot of these patients for half days. We, we do a number of clinics per week. We see a number of patients per week. We, we collect our views to make sure that we're doing our jobs. And we slowly, over time, develop a reputation. We're a good clinician. And if we have the opportunity, and in my view, the great opportunity and privilege to have some students around and to teach some residents in our clinics, then we become an educator. And those two put together are clinician educators, the majority of academicians in the United States are now clinician educators. They're a key aspect of what we do today. And if you do that for a number of years and you make a few publications and you're part of professional organizations and engage in curriculum development, all these things, you become a master clinician educator or a clinician scholar. Hmm? And that is very important. And we applaud everybody who's at the stage, which really is responsible for the most of the burden of education and patient care at our institutions. Crucial. Okay, but I won't cure my patient. I won't cure my patient. I will take care of them with less uncertainty, but I won't cure my patient. And so Flexner viewed this in a very different way, and I don't need to describe to this audience who Abraham Flexner is, but he had a different view about medical education, about physicians in academia, medicine as an experimental discipline. He viewed the scientific method of thinking as to be applied for medical practice spend more time in the laboratory, in clinic, rather than in the theater. He felt students should be more in the practice of seeing patients and in the laboratory, as opposed to just lectures like this one. <laughs> Research is critical, he felt, not only for the new knowledge that would be produced, but also for stimulation, excitement, and critical rigor that research would bring to teaching. He espoused a model system of medical education in which all schools were to be of the same kind, all schools of the same kind, university-based, research-oriented, where most of the faculty at the institution would have opportunities to engage in meaningful research. This is from a recent article that I recommend you read by Kenneth Lugner from uh, Washington University. And so he's talking about the physician scientist. He's talking about my doctor, my scientist that I mentioned in the title. And so what do I do to do that? Well. You, in addition to this, you also have to be mentor, and you have to be trained in research, and you have to begin to generate some new knowledge, which is described and disseminated in manuscripts, and you obtain some grants, and you do some presentations, and you do that over time, and you become an investigator, and when you plug these two together, you're a physician scientist or a clinician investigator, whatever way you want to uh, describe those two. And so... What I want to do is, or what I did, is then go back to my patient and, and let's, let's dig a little bit more through the eyes of a physician scientist. Through the eyes of a physician scientist. So I learned a little bit more. She was a premature baby, and you're going to say, well, how does that help me? Well, you'll see. Uh, parents were smokers, and I don't care if you are not a smoker when you're a child. If your parents smoke two or three packs a day in a little house, you're smoking. Uh, she had early, several early infections. When she was a child, one of them had to be hospitalized. She is a smoker, has an anxiety disorder, and she has failed several smoking cessation programs, including Bernalquin. She's an alcoholic, about a half to a whole bottle of wine every day or every two days. Uh, she has some memory loss that has been ascribed to aging. 
She has interstitial disease and emphysema. I told you that before. She may have lung cancer, and she has no insurance. Remember, my clinic is a volunteer clinic, so we see everybody, so, but we don't, so we don't we check for insurance. So she is uninsured. And when you put these things together, you get to seven areas of clear importance here. Early infections, chronic smoking, alcoholism, chronic lung disease, possible cancer, aging, and lack of insurance. And I will tell you, I'm not sure if you have a cure for any of the above in this patient. And it doesn't matter if she's in Puerto Rico or in Louisville. There are, these are very difficult things to treat. You may think that by telling somebody for 15 minutes to stop smoking, you're taking care of it. You have not. The majority of these patients will continue to smoke despite your best efforts. And so how do we think about these? And, and so I wanted to think about this as a physician scientist, and I want to bring you a few examples of how this looks like. Now, whether it has an impact on this particular patient today or not, probably not. But I want to believe that it may have an impact for my future patients or patients that come beyond my time. Okay? So let's talk about early infections. What is the relevance of early infections? We're Stern and others, but there's been a number of articles since then. This is now old. Started looking at children and their pulmonary function tests and divided them in quartiles depending on their pulmonary function tests. The, the number here is not important, but you all know the FE1 and so forth. But what's important is they looked at them over time. They now have more data from earlier children, earlier age children. And what they determine is that if you're in the lower quartile, which is essentially normal, what did I do? Ah. If you're in the lower quartile of pulmonary function tests, you will remain in the lower quartile as you age. You will lose lung function as you age, and many of my students know that you lose about 25 to 30 cc's a year in FE1. You will continue to lose, but if you're down here, you will remain down there. Now, now this is norma normality. Think about if you had exposures here that impact this. And what this tells me is that your lung function has been predetermined since childhood. Predetermined. So it's important to know what happened if you were a premature baby, if your mother smoked when you were a child and so forth, to understand why a patient today may have chronic lung disease. Probably true for other organs as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, had a, I have a predoctoral student, Ryan McAllister, who wanted to study that and came to the lab. He had done some work with virology. He said he wanted to study the hypothesis, can early childhood infection lead to chronic lung disease in the adult? So there's a lot of data to suggest that chronic or early exposures in life affect adult. But these are all through cross-sectional studies, some longitudinal studies, no cause and effect. But because of his uh, expertise in viruses, he decided, well, why don't we study influenza A? We all have been exposed to a patient with influenza A. You may have been exposed to influenza A itself. Okay, this is some data for influenza A. You know that. Uh, but we see a lot of that in the pandemic uh, influenza A, PH1, and H1N1 that occurred in 2009 was terrible and affected many children, okay, which at ages where vaccination is not that great, okay. So he developed an animal model for this. He obtained the virus. He adapted it to the mouse because we don't want to study this in humans. He made sure they had the appropriate mutations for the adapted mouse. He characterized the animal model. He did several doses and several stages and came up with this data. So these are just limited data that he's presented. 14-day-old and 30-day-old mice. These are young mice, if you're a mouse expert. And he started looking at the tissue. And as you see, this tissue goes from a normal lung to those little holes, a very nice, alveoli, beautiful lung structure. And it all gets affected by inflammation. But then he stained for trichrome staining that detects collagen in blue. So I don't know if you can see this blue from there, but you certainly can see this blue from here. Can you see that blue? Clearly not after I change the slide. You see that blue there? That's excess deposition of collagen, and it looks like mainly around the airways, okay? So influenza I, A during early infection, at least in mice, begins to remodel your lung. Now, we don't know yet if this remains until adulthood, but what he did is he put some of these animals aside, and he waited seven months. Again, if you're a mouse doctor, you know that at seven months of age, that's an adult mouse, and he did pulmonary function tests with the help of Gary Hoyle in the School of Public Health. And he found that at baseline, they all looked okay. But as he 
uh, treated it with methacholine. Many of you have used methacholine challenge to evaluate a patient with possible asthma. It's a bronchoconstrictor. He started identifying changes in tissue elastins. The actual variable is not important today because I want to keep this simple. But basically, he's starting to show that there are abnormalities in the physiology of these animals. This is very preliminary data, not published yet, but it suggests that we might have a model to begin to understand what are the implications of early infection, at least with viruses, and at least in mice and other mammal system for chronic lung disease. Now, how about if you continue to smoke? Now, you don't have to, as I said, you don't have to be smoking as a baby. Oh, this, this, this always gives me a kick. I just think it's just incredible. But also, remember, if your mother smokes or you're exposed to a high smoking environment, nicotine transverses the placenta. And there's been a lot of data to link prenatal exposure to tobacco to asthma, for example, but also other chronic diseases. Here's some of the data showing that the prevalence, the incidence, the diagnosis of asthma is higher in children who have been exposed to tobacco. And so we had a, a junior faculty, Sherry Wintercle, who joined my laboratory, who was pregnant at the time, and wanted to study the effects of nicotine and branching morphogenesis. This is a little mouse lung dissected from a mouse when the lung had two branches, and now you can hardly count the number of branches here. And basically she showed that indeed that she exposed those lungs to nicotine ex vivo, she could alter branching morphogenesis. The development of the lung was very abnormal. But what she really wanted to study, well, that's okay in the mouse, and that's okay in vitro or ex vivo, but what would happen in vivo and what are the mechanisms? And she got interested in nicotinic receptors. And so she got interested in nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, of which there are a number in the body, the most common, the alpha-7. These are pentamers, five arms. And when nicotine hits the ligand binding site, that receptor sort of gets tweaked, opens up, and now allows, like a pore, the influx of cations, and now you have signal suction. So she obtained animals that were deficient in this receptor for nicotine and exposed them to nicotine. They say, what would happen? Is this, you know, and this is what she found. Number one, when she does morphometric analysis, she finds that the wall area of the nicotine-treated animals for the airways is thicker than those of no nicotine. But importantly, she found that there was an increase in that lung of expression of collagen, whereas in the knockout animals that didn't have the receptor, no change. But interestingly enough, she did pulmonary function tests on these animals. So if they were exposed to nicotine, when they were in gestation, and then later on, they find that these animals all had decreased pulmonary function tests, but not in the animals that were deficient in this receptor. And what that suggests is that nicotine exposure can impact lung structure and function in the mouse through a specific receptor, and it starts telling you, hey, if I can't make them stop smoking, could I make a reagent against this receptor so that the embryonic tissue cannot detect this? Now, this is important for those of you who are interested in e-cigarettes. That means that nicotine is not as safe. Or when you place nicotine patch on, I didn't realize my microphone was close to my chest. When you put a nicotine patch on a pregnant woman to stop her from smoking, clearly the cardiologist in the room and the oncologist feel it's better nicotine than the actual effects of the entire uh, smoking cohort of reagents, of many of which are clearly carcinogenic, but it's not entirely safe. But what she also did was she did a methacholine challenge. I told you that as you look at increase in doses of methacholine, she looked at airway resistance, and she found that the highest airway resistance was in the animals who were exposed to nicotine. Not much in the untreated, but look at the knockouts. There was no hyperactivity. Again, Nicotine can induce structural abnormalities, functional abnormalities, and hyperactivities, which is essentially what? The definition of asthma. Nicotine induced asthma. Okay? Now let's talk about smoking. How about if you continue to smoke as an adult? And so Glenn Vickery came to the lab. He just graduated this summer. He's a PhD a student at that time. He wanted to test can nicotine exposure promote lung remodeling in the adult via alpha-7 nicotinic receptors, because he had heard about this data. And the short of the point is it is answers yes, both in vitro and in vivo. These are in vivo data. And you see more blue here and more red. These are two different stains. And you can see increased collagen deposition, particularly around the airways. And so nicotine can indeed continue to do so. We were not surprised about that, because we have shown in the past, and I think you've seen this slide before, where animals exposed to nicotine produce more fibronectin than animals who are not exposed to nicotine, okay? 
And so I want to here put aside to fibronectin because you're going to see this term again. Fibronectin is a matrix molecule. It's produced. If you scratch yourself and you bleed a little bit, you're going to make a lot of fibrin and fibronectin. Those two together make a clot. Okay? But fibronectin has been implicated in development and injury and repair, vascularization, cytokine expression, and so forth. Independent of what you believe about fibronectin, we use it as a marker that something is wrong. If fibronectin is up, something is wrong. Remodeling has been activated. Think about that when I go next. So what all this suggests to us is that infection and tobacco exposure during the perinatal period or early childhood can induce chronic lung remodeling in my patient. And that, if you continue to smoke through these particular receptors, you can engage in chronic lung disease. So that gives me a sense of understanding how this woman got to where she was and perhaps begin to look at why most others do not reach her point. Do they have alterations in this expression? But more importantly, I can begin to identify targets for intervention. Should I develop new vaccines that are more effective in those children? Should I affect the binding of the virus to the epithelial cells in the lung? Can I target this? And remember the Chantic, the Renoclin, is an agent against a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Industry already has the power, the ability, the technology to actually develop such reagents. How about alcoholism? Now, you have heard me because last year I talked about Tom Petty. Remember Tom Petty? Not the singer. And uh, Tom Petty described acute lung injury in 1967. But until 1996, nobody cared much about the relation between alcohol and the lung until Mark Moss came along with his group. And he studied a number of patients with acute lung injury and found the majority of his patients with acute lung injury were alcoholics, something we don't ask because they're usually intubated. Okay, We don't ask the family with carefully developed uh, questionnaires. And he found not only they had a higher incidence of acute lung injury, but also higher mortality. And today, chronic alcohol abuse has become one of the most prominent and important predisposing factors for acute lung injury. So if you're in the ER and somebody has sepsis or aspiration of gastric contents or pneumonia or pancreatitis, and you make a history and they are highly positive for chronic alcohol abuse, they have a high likelihood of ARDS and mortality in your ICU. You can determine that when they come to the ER, if you spend the time to ask those right questions. Okay? And this is Tom Petty and acute lung injury with non-cardiogenic pulmonoedema, 40% mortality as of today. And David Guido did a lot of work at Emory. He's a colleague of mine who studied in a rat model how that happens. And he showed that, indeed, if you expose a rat to alcohol, those rats are very happy, uh, they are susceptible to lung injury when you make them septic. So Jefferson, Tyler, and Ellison Torres, and I, Ellison has escaped every camera in this uh, university because I can't find a picture of him. Ellison, if you're here, sorry. If you're here, stand up so that people can see you. Yes, people can see Ellison's face. So almost everything I'm showing you today has Jeff's and Ellison hands on it. And the people who work in my lab know that. But I'm just going to focus on this as project where they wanted to know if alcohol can promote susceptibility to lung disease. She's an alcoholic. Could that affect her predisposition to chronic lung disease? And what they found was that, indeed, in fibroblastic culture, fibronectin goes up. I told you what fibronectin means. And also, in the lung, there's increased deposition of fibronectin. Notice the, the intensity difference here. Very minor, subtle changes, but begin to change the relative composition. But what's most interesting to me is they began to think about nicotine and how it works. And they have now demonstrated that it seems like alcohol may work through another type of nicotine receptor that it seems that it's not in a ligand-dependent way like nicotine does, that it binds, but that induces oxygen stress. Alcohol becomes acetaldehyde, and that tweaks the receptor. Why? Because that receptor has very interesting cysteine residues, and that tweaks the receptor to open up and start triggering. And that triggering, we have shown, can change how that fibroblast behave, produce more extracellular matrix, become more myofibroblastic, and develop a full fibrotic phenotype. Mm -hmm. So alcoholism is contributing to her problem, to her lung disease, as we speak. Okay? So it, I start adding to my list. I have viral infection when she was a child. She is exposed to nicotine, among other things. She's exposed to chronic alcohol. I identify a couple of targets for intervention. That produces lung remodeling dysfunction, and that leads ultimately to lung disease. Now, how about the cancer? How does that relate, Dr. Roman? Well, I put this slide again here because the majority of lung cancer that we see is in patients with chronic lung disease. Okay? That doesn't mean that normal people with normal 
people with normal lungs cannot develop lung cancer. We certainly have learned about mutations that can do that. But over 80 to 90% of patients with lung cancer have chronic lung disease. Okay? And so the question is, is this because they also are smokers? Or is this something about the chronic lung disease lung that promotes proliferation of some cells and their escape into carcinogenesis? I don't know that. But here's another, my fibronectin friend is back here. Here's a normal lung stained for fibronectin. And you can see the tumor. Uh, this is a lung adenocarcinoma also loaded with fibronectin. I don't know what that means, but I'll get back to that. But John Greenwell came in the lab. Is John around? John just de defended to his committee yesterday. He's doing good. He's happy, I think. Uh, he's either working in the lab or back here in the auditorium. He said, tissue remodeling renders the host susceptible to lung cancer progression because it establishes a pro-oncogenic phenotype a microenvironment that is out there, perhaps because there's too much fibronectin in there. He said, let's just try this, Jesse. Let's just test this out. And so he, what he did is he, he's got to injure the animal because it can't be a normal lung, and he used bleomycin. I presented to you before that bleomycin is an agent that could cause lung fibrosis, both in humans, treated for Hodgkin's, for example, as it is in animals. And here's a mouse treated with nothing or a saline and a mouse treated with bleomycin. There's tremendous amount of inflammation and fibrosis. And what he did is he injected these mice with tumor cells in the periphery. And then he looked at the lungs and said, how many of these mice have tumors and how many are they? And what he finds is that in the animals that had fibrosis and inflammation, there were more metastatic lesions of the lung. So there's a, how these things pack on top of each other to promote not only chronic lung disease, but also carcinogenesis. Hmm? Not only that, he went back and studied that lung by histology and found that most of the tumors were on the fibrotic area, not on the normal areas. So if you looked at what are the tumors that are top of fibrotic areas versus normal lung, over 80 to 90 percent of them were on the fibrotic lung, which suggests that the fibrotic lung allows for perhaps the transformation of cancer cells, but certainly the migration. It serves as a scaffold for these cells to organize and to develop their microenvironment. And here comes my fibronectin friend again. Here's a splicing variant of fibronectin that has been knocked out, is no, not present in these animals. And what you find is, again, more tumors in the lungs of these bleomycin-treated animals, but it goes away with fibronectin when you don't have fibronectin, suggesting not only fibronectin is important for that interplay here, but it's a target for intervention. It's a target for intervention. It's a molecule that when I get rid of it and nothing else, it's affecting whether these animals develop tumor progression in their lungs. Hmm? And so I keep on adding viral infections, nicotine, ethanol exposure, certain targets causing chronic remodeling may conduce chronic lung disease. And if you have enough fibronectin EDA around, I'm sure this is quite simplistic and there's a lot more, you can promote carcinogenesis and the progression of tumors in your lungs. Okay. How about aging? She's an elderly woman. We're all aging. And as you know, this is uh, data related to IPF. The estimated prevalence and annual incidence of IPF goes up with age. As you can see here, so does emphysema. And that's why most of our patients in our clinic are over 50 years of age. It takes time. But it's also, it's not just takes time to exposure. There's something about the aging lung. And what I didn't tell you about John's data, Caleb as we call him, is that this increase in metastasis to lung only happened in the old mouse, not in the young mouse. The young mouse could care less. Those of you who are young, stay young. Okay? So the aging not only has bleomycin increases the incidence, but if they're older, they have more of an impact. Okay? And so he decided to look at this prospectively in normal mice, and he find that in normal mice, untreated, if you're young, you don't develop tumors in the lung but you do develop tumors in the older mice, okay? Now, this is, this, we were excited about those findings, but we were not surprised because I've shown you some of this data before with Mauricio Rojas, Rianush, and our group had shown that if you treat with bleomycin in old lung, they have more injury, okay? These are mice, and you can analyze that biochemically. And that that lung is very abnormal. The aging lung in a mouse has more collagen, more proteases, and the expression of genes that are pro-fibrotic are already screwed up. Your lung has a pro-fibrotic phenotype. Even though it may be normal today, it is just ready for that hit, that car crash, 
that pneumonia, that aspiration for gastric contents, that chronic alcoholism, that persistent smoking, that exposure to asbestos, that farming, that bird that you keep in the back of your house that you feed every day, all these things could become exposures in the right genetic background, in the right setting, can lead to chronic lung disease and cancer. Hmm? So we started thinking, digging, let's dig more. Uh, well, how did, you know, we know a lot of these things about aging, about inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, oxidative stress. Could there be a relationship between oxidative stress and tissue remodeling? And Dean Jones at Emory had shown in looking at a number of patients that as you age, you become more oxidized. So your lung is not only pro-fibrotic, but you're more oxidized as you age, okay? And, and so we said, could this be the cause of the remodeling process? Could it be possible that as you age, you become more oxidized? It's, you're not dying, but your lung is already remodeling because of that, and could I intervene in that? And Dean has already shown that if you look at redox potential for thiodisulfide couples like cysteine and cysteine, we can measure that, I presented this before, that you become oxidized as you have a poor diet, as you age, as you're alcoholic, as you have diabetes, and you smoke, and you have other problems like myocardial defects, or you went through BMT, uh, atrial fibrillation, lung transportation, you begin to oxidize more and more and more. And that oxidation leads to fibroblasts in the lung to proliferate more, as you see here when you oxidize the media, and then make more, my friend, fibronectin. So as you are older and you are more oxidized, your fibroblasts are proliferating and they're making more of this molecule that we think triggers remodeling. And so these two guys, Yu Xuan Zhang and Bert Watson, who are sitting here uh, in the auditorium, said, well, you know, can cells control the redox state? How, do, how, does, how does a patient get oxidation? Uh, and can this be manipulated? Because that's, in the end, the name of the game is, can I manipulate this? so that I can treat my patient. Hmm? And the first thing they did, and Bert presented some of this before, he looked at young fibroblasts. These are fibroblasts obtained from young mice, lungs, cultured them in vitro, and put them in media that was reduced or oxidized. Reduced or oxidized. And they went home, and they had dinner, and they watched TV, Fox News or CNN, whatever your preference, and they come back, and they reach some certain level close to what normal is. In this case, it was 95 millivolts. You and I walk around, hopefully, around 80, 81 millivolts. But basically, fibroblasts can control their surrounding redox state, but not if it's an old fibroblast. And in fact, if you take a lung fibroblast from an older animal, they can come back to normal after reduction. But if you put them on an oxidized state, they can't do it. They can't do it, and this is a difference of about 40 millivolts, which is higher than what you'll see in aging, okay? And what this suggests to us is that cells in your body, fibroblasts included, control your redox state, but as you age, there's a defect in controlling that, and now you slowly but surely become oxidized, and that promotes a prophrobotic state, and that is part of the process that leads you to chronic lung disease if you're exposed to other things. And so when they looked at a whole bunch of genes, they found one that happens to be a cysteine transporter, and they now have great data that I won't be able to show today, that this cysteine transporter seems to be responsible and perhaps the main uh, agent that is responsible for the control of the redox state in these cells. And the next step, is this true in the whole animal? And the next step, is this true in human? And the next step, can I target it? And the next step, does that have, is that safe? And the next step, is that helpful? That's going to take time. But seeing the patient through the eyes of science. Okay? So I keep on adding viral infection, nicotine exposure, chronic alcohol abuse, aging through different targets can affect lung remodeling dysfunction, ultimately lead to lung disease, okay? And, of course, lung cancer, as I mentioned before. And that brings me at the, almost at the end here, the process of chronic lung disease. And we've learned over time that some of these very sophisticated entities, this is true for all specialties, 
cannot be done by a single physician referring to somebody else at another hospital and sending this slide to a pathologist at Mayo Clinic. You really have to have a team of experts who are devoted to this condition if you really want to develop a program of excellence and deliver excellent, outstanding, state-of-the-art, world-class care. And we have that in interstitial lung disease here. Some of these people are no longer with us, have been replaced with others. But we basically, I want to thank Ralph and Tammy Paris, who followed me from Emory University and continue to work with us as this group. I was just in a patient support group yesterday talking about anxiety and depressions in patients with chronic interstitial lung disease. But we have expert radiologists, Dr. Reed and uh, the interim chair of radiology. We had a pulmonary hypertension person who now we have Dr. Ert Kirsch helping us. We have an expert pathologist who was recruited to the institution because of expertise in lung cancer and interstitial lung disease and respiratory uh, therapies as well as coordinators for research. And that has allowed us to be part of the most important clinical trials that have been generated in this country and abroad related to IPF. These trials that ultimately led to the development of two drugs, two drugs that no longer allow for the rapid decline of lung function of these patients, but they slow it down. They don't cure it, they make you better, but they slow it down. And we were happy to be part of that. And our patients come here because we have access to those opportunities. Okay? And we've even gone to the point of going back to the laboratory. And Igor, I don't know if Igor Selko is here, but in many of the patients, we see pulmonary hypertension. Don't you see a lot of patients with chronic lung disease who also have big arteries on the uh, exam and the echoes have pulmonary hypertension? We send them to you guys all the time. And, and Igor has now developed two models of fibrosis, one with bromycin and one with silica, silicosis, big deal in Kentucky. And he shows tremendous amount of vascular remodeling, vascular remodeling to quantify that. So we now have a model not only to study fibrotic lung disease, but how that relates to the vasculature. It's not just that the lung is being destroyed. The vasculature also engages in this process of remodeling. What are the implications for thrombogenesis, for increased pulmonary emboli, for increased pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, and so forth? And let me end with the patient being uninsured. And of course, these are the, the ones that I feel least able to address. No? The country is in a state of healthcare denial the U.S. lags behind our other industrialized nations in many important health measures, partly because citizens of certain races, ethnicities, and incomes experience poorer versions of U.S. health care. Poorer versions of U.S. health care than others. The disparities are glaring. Don't take it from me. Take it from people who deal with this all the time. And so this leads to this map, where prognosis of your condition or of you can be predicted based on your zip code. Can you imagine that? That your outcome, I can pretty much say where you are close if you tell me where you live. That's not how we should treat patients where their outcomes is predicted by zip code as opposed to what we deliver to them. Huh? But as you see here, the more red, the worse. And of course, look at where we are near the Appalachian Trail, but we're not too far from that. Okay, but look at this entire Southeast region. Hmm? And you look at more data that has been published by this group, when you look at changes and improvement, it's actually going the other way. There's been increases in the gap in the ability of our patients to access care. Hmm? And so in this article, Marray discussed that disparities may result from errors, not just in insurance, not just in not getting care, but in errors that are related neither to access to care nor to positive physiological differences but rather to historical dearth of control populations that include persons of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. They went back and studied patients with hypertrophic heart disease. And they had to reclassify everybody as normal because in those 300 patients that they had defined based on a mutation, it turns out that mutation was very common in African Americans and other minorities. They just weren't included in the clinical trials. So now they have groups of families that have been defined as having a heart disease, a mutation that is going to kill you. Don't play basketball. Don't play football because you're going to die in the arena like these kids that we've seen. Huh? When in fact they were normal, but we didn't know because we did not include certain populations in clinical trials. And this is a study that Esteban, my friend from USF, published some years ago where he looked at all NIH-funded studies in respiratory disease and he found that less than 5% of them 
included racial or ethnic minorities. So even though when the NIH demands that you include a reasonable number of minorities and diversity in your studies, less than 5% did that. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, there's bias on the patients and the referring doctors, but there are bias on us too. We have biases that prevent us from including these patients. Mm -hmm. And by knowing this data, you could pull back and say, you know, should I send this patient to Jesse or to Roberto or to Henry or somebody else for a clinical trial rather than, well, they're uninsured or they're gonna, not going to come. That's the biases we have all the time. Okay? And this is a paper that actually was forwarded to me by Barbara Casper. I think she's not here. But this is a paper published in JAMA, Internal Medicine, that actually looked, can we make a difference on this? Because one of the concerns that people had when you develop Obamacare, for example, as an example of trying to improve access to health care, the idea was that there was no data that access to care would actually improve care. That just because you have access to care, that you have insurance, that now you're going to seek a doctor. That now you're going to go less to the emergency room. That there's, there was not much data for that. Well, there is plenty of data for that. And this article shows that everything they looked at was actually positive. And the two states that actually got into Medicaid expansion, Kentucky being the most prominent one, Arkansas being the other one, and compared to Texas that chose not to expand in Medicaid. Clear evidence. Now, of course, this was by surveys. But still, the data was impressive, at least to me that there were tremendous changes in the access to care of these patients and diabetic control and ER visits and so forth. If you were in a state that was impacted by Medicare expansion versus a state that is not, we have ability to intervene. This doesn't require Caleb to be in the lab to do a mouse. We have the ability to intervene. Okay? All, all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare, is the most shocking and inhumane. And I bring Martin Luther King here because we all know his quotes about disparity, but we don't know a lot of quotes that relate to health care. This is what this guy said. Somebody who we admire, who we think had an important change in the way the United States views its people, its population. He saw that from the beginning. This is the most shocking and inhumane. And we see this every day, every single day. And I'm not sure what we, including me, do about it. Okay? So when I look at my patients today, I don't look at them as a patient with chronic lung disease, so I'm going to do a CT scan and send to oncology for evaluation of cancer. I look at them as cases that have been affected by genetics, by race and ethnicity, by poverty, by lack of insurance, that ultimately led in many ways to exposure to tobacco and chronic alcohol abuse and viral infections, ultimately that they age, sometimes accelerated aging, like many people are talking about. And that that induces chronic lung remodeling, end up to, with me because of chronic lung disease and ultimately with a higher predisposition of lung cancer. And instead of looking at that patient to do PFTs in cancer, after I order all that, I pull back and start thinking, where could I intervene? Could I intervene here? 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 Where could I intervene? That's the future of healthcare. That's the future of healthcare. The rest of healthcare is what we're doing now, what we've been doing for two decades. So, Flex you know, one of this, but my patients demand this. This is Ashley and Donna Apple. Ashley, when she was a baby, she's now 29 years old, she almost died of bleeding. In fact, she went into hemorrhagic shock, okay? And when they came out of the hospital, the mom and dad would grab a side, they live in Long Island, and they were told that her daughter suffered from a rare syndrome called hermansky fulak syndrome. And the mother said, I'm sorry, what? hermansky fulak syndrome is a disease that is more common in people from Puerto Rico. It gives you albinism, but they're blonde and very white. Who could tell? They have bleeding disorders because of platelet dysfunction. And many of them have a genetic mutation called HPS1, although there are 10 of them. And all of them develop pulmonary fibrosis at a certain stage in their disease. And she left her career as a critical care, successful critical care nurse to devote her life to advocacy in hermansky pulak syndrome. And she developed, in those days, 20 years ago, the hermansky pulak syndrome network, got the NIH to engage in this. And in fact, she describes how in the early days of this network, 
people, families from all over the country in Puerto Rico would come to her house and spend a weekend where the basement the NIH has set up to bleed, to do genetic studies, to get consent forms and everything. And from there on, they identified at least three to five new mutations over the past decade and a half uh, related to this condition. And when we were talking about what to do in Puerto Rico, she wanted us to focus on this. And we talked about how to develop a center to take care of these patients clinically. And she was disappointed. I had taken my time to develop a center in Puerto Rico to see patients on a monthly basis, on a volunteer basis, to create a team, to get the medical school involved, to get a hospital, to give me free secretary, free space. And when I talked to her about it, she was disappointed. And I should have been too. She was disappointed because she said, Dr. Roman, I'm happy the Puerto Ricans have access to you now, but that will not save my daughter. What will you do that is new? My daughter has good care. We've taken care of that. We are lucky enough that we have the resources to provide my daughter to the best access of care she has. That's not going to change the fact that she has a higher mortality. It will not make a difference for the people you see either. Because in the end of the day, like my other patient, she has a mutation that promotes the disease and there's no FDA approved interventions. And nobody's doing anything about it. And so we engage in that process of, of discussion of how you can't do good clinical research without having a strong clinical foundation. We had to establish first a strong clinical foundation. We needed good doctors who understood the disease, who were empathic to the needs of these patients before we can begin to ask them, can you give me a little bit of blood or a piece of your lung, for God's sake? But that takes time. It can only be seen ahead of time and perceived through the eyes of a physician, scientist, and clinical investigator. Okay? So in times of crisis, unfortunately, oops, in times of crisis, cutting research becomes an easy target for intervention. Hmm? You spend money on developing labs, on creating people. You spend lots of money on sustaining investigators until they get their first grants. Even if they get their first grants, that money is devoted to research. It doesn't bring a lot more money to the institution, but it brings reputation and so forth. And yet Flexner felt that you needed that to provide the best medical education and to advance discovery. Okay? And what I just told you is that my patients feel they need that too. They need that too. So because we cannot advance medicine or medical education without research. It's not possible. Now, I will finish with a couple of slides telling you how do I got here. And it's all about mentorship. I like this quote because I think it's true. Ideal teachers, many of them here, ideal teachers and mentors are those who use themselves as bridges over which they invite their students to cross, then having facilitated their crossing, joyfully collapse. I love this part. Joyfully collapse, encouraging them to create bridges of their own. Mm -hmm. So I have three people to thank. One is someone you may recognize that face as my father. My father was a PhD. He wanted to be a doctor, but he didn't have the resources. Family was too poor. They didn't have the resources to do this. So at a, a later age, he developed a PhD in entomology. He did insects for agriculture. Then he became a nematologist funded by the University of Puerto Rico. And he became a, what he calls a worm doctor. And so I often saw him reading, writing, I visited his lab when I was a child, looking in the microscope and drawing, because there were no computers, drawing the head of a nematode. So you can identify one nematode versus another. Uh, and he was fascinated by that. And I, and I saw that. I saw that inspiration that he got out of this work. And then I was exposed to this man, Martinez Maldonado, who was the head of the Department of Medicine at the VA in San Juan. I went to the VA in San Juan to do internal medicine, and he pushed me to come to the States, not to become a great doctor. He said, I turn you into one. I don't need you to become a good doctor. I train you well. But I want you to learn science. I want you to learn science. And I did. And I ended up in the laboratory of John McDonald. John McDonald, who was the head of the Division of Pulmonary at Washington University. And John taught me, but mainly Tom. John will be the first to agree that Tom, pretty much like Jeff Riesenthaler in my laboratory, taught me everything I know about science about the scientific method, about how to write a grant, how to write a paper. And of course, 
I guess he taught me how to age. <laughs> Clearly something happened. We haven't dealt with that issue. Andy Limper was there too, who's the head of thoracic medicine at Mayo Clinic and several other people who, who you may have, may have known. So I want to finish by thanking all of you. I want to thank my mentors. I want to thank my colleagues because often they have to take over one day because I'm in some meeting or writing some grant. For my staff, they do the same all the time and keep me out of trouble. But mostly my students, the lab gang, and the patients, and the patients who you see here from Puerto Rico, because they can't always reach me by phone. Henry knows this. They can't always get to me to answer or see them in the clinic when they want to. And very often, I spend time telling them, if you want me as your doctor, that's OK. But look at all the other stuff I do. And you need to understand that that has implications for when you can reach me. But it will not have implications for your care. But it's your choice. You want a physician scientist or someone else. It's, it's OK with me. And, and they've been very much an inspiration to me to stick with me through all of this, but also to inspire me to continue to do the work we do. And I'll stop here, but I thank them for allowing me to see and treat my patients as a physician scientist. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. So remember that these are percent um, predictive values. So I'll pick 1,000 people, and I'll call that normal. And I'll do an average and two standard deviations. So people can still be a little bit higher than normal, and that's still normal for them. That's why we look at trends rather than absolute values. The points of that slide was that even though at the beginning all of them was over 80%, all of them were essentially 80% or above, which is normal. The pulmonologists in the room know that. Although there's tremendous variability. They all remain where they were 20 years out, 15 to 20 years out. So that means that your pulmonary function test at this early stage is already predetermined for the rest of your life. And therefore, if you happen to be in the lower quartile, any exposures will affect you more than someone who's higher. Because if I have 100%, I have to drop 20 points before I become abnormal or before I have any symptoms. Whereas you, you drop a little bit more, you're there. You're in my clinic. Okay, And that was determined not by the hit today, but by the hit when you were born. And I think that's, there's a lot of data that still needs to be collected to prove that that's true. But that's, that's an awesome thought, that you don't no longer have much control over your lung function test other than what you can do now. But whatever is done is done. Isn't that interesting? Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> OK. What else? Comments? I want to leave you with, with another message which is quite interesting to me. And that is that we, our world is evolving away from the flexionarian model. You see that at this institution and most others. We're evolving away from the flexionarian model. The insurance issues, the constraints in revenue generation, the problems of the NIH and so forth are leading all of us to be at the clinic all the time. We're at the clinic all the time. No? And we're doing electronic records, and we don't have a lot of more time. And many of you will say, well, that's great for you, Jesse, that had the right mentors and had the right exposure and so forth. But I, I, I just, at this stage, I'm, all I can do is see my patients and do the best I can. And, th and that's true. It is my impression that the majority of the institutions in the United States and around the world are moving more and more towards that model. And that there is a more of a gap between the physician scientists and the clinician educator, and certainly more of a gap between the clinic and the bench. Only few are doing this, more are doing that, and there's little discussion, OK? So I want to encourage the residents and the students of the trainee to seek out these opportunities for research. But I also want to encourage the scientists to get out of the laboratory. Get out of the laboratory. 
speak to the students, speak to the trainees, ask the school if they can give you an opportunity to give a lecture. Talk to Jan to see if you can do more rounds or be part of the discussion when you interview candidates so that they can see all the components that makes this institution great because not a single component is better. This is just one component of what stuff that makes us great. There's a lot of good stuff here. But in the absence of this, as it will be the absence of an educator or an administrator or whatever, we would be insufficient. We are seeing less and less of this component of academic medicine. And only the top organizations are continuing with the flexionaire model. That means that in the next decade or two, we will see more and more of this gap where you have institutions that are the research-oriented institutions and the institutions that are clinically devoted. That's not the way Flexner view this company. And I may argue that evolution does things for a reason that we'll be fine, but I'm a dinosaur, and I still believe in the Flexner model. And we have to do something to prevent further erosion of that model. Thank you, and you have a good Thursday.